brought to you almost live from the dude in the basement studios. Why? Because that's where the good stuff is. It sips, suds, and smokes with your smoke and host, the good old boys. Suds, suds, suds. It's time for more suds. It is definitely time for more suds. And me today on this suds episode where everything good in life is worth discussing. This is lay brother Mike here. Joining me here at the table is Monk Jason. Hello, everyone. And Prior Shay. Howdy. <laughs> so you're a Southern prior is that is That's that what right. it's going to be? Southern. Hey, yes. how y'all doing out there at the back of the meat factory? <laughs> how y'all doing? God bless y'all. <laughs> Sip Suds and Smokes is sponsored by Craft Beer Kings. Craft Beer Kings, the home for all your beer, wine, and mead needs. They are also the home of the Mystery Box. You can check them out at www.craftbeerkings.com. Welcome to another riveting Masterpiece Mead Theatre Show, where you're going to be discussing yet another episode of poor fake British accents, cheeky pan flute music, and all things mead today. Our uh, sud segments are all about beer, beer, and today it's all about mead. Today's episode is going to be featuring three meads that we're going to get to talk about. But first, Shay gets the honors of going over our suds ratings for today. We'll be tasting and discussing these beers, rating them with a suds rating, plus our signature belching sounds. <laughs> that was not belching. <laughs> and here are those ratings. <laughs> suds number one. This sucks. Give me anything but a bud. Sounds like a belch. Yeah. At the wrong port. Oh. <laughs> I don't know where you've been hearing belching like that. Number two, was that a belch? And it was. Number three, ah, what a relief. Which is generally what most people say around me. Ah, what a relief. He's leaving. (laughs) Number four, a body should really not make that sound. I love the halo music. (laughs) Number five, listen to that hang time. Give me another. It really should be a golf clap. What? It really should be a golf clap. A golf clap? <laughs> well, here's what Hank thinks. I wish we could smell this radio show and those belch ratings. <laughs> Most definitely. Well, uh, thank you very much for reading our Suds ratings for today, Prior Shay. Today's episode of Masterpiece Mead Theater will feature several great meads, which we're going to get over in this really, really bad, thick British accent as I go over these meads that we're going to be discussing for today. We have three meads that we're going to go over. The first one is Miel de Garde from Bee Nectar, episode 13, also from Bee Nectar, and the statement from Shrams are the three meads that we're going to go over in this episode today. Hey, if you uh, would like to know all about mead, check out our Mead 101 show. It is available um, on our back catalog as well, and you'll find out all about meads in general. Now, I had some other discussion topics uh, to talk about today, mainly mead ingredients. Now, these products feature such a wide range of ingredients, and when I tend to think about mead, I think about local, L-O-C-A-L, local. Um, You know, with modern transportation, the ability to preserve fresh ingredients, I mean, do you think that that has influenced the quality of mead that's actually available to consumers today? Is it making it better or worse? I think in some ways it it really does uh, uh, help in terms of, um, you know, a lot of a lot of things in this day and age, the farm to table, the local, the organic uh, that's helping with fruits, uh, you know, getting high quality fruits to include in meads, um, spices, and things of that nature. However, 
in one regard, I don't know that it really makes that big a difference. Honey is one of those, it's the original preservable food. It travels well. It's It, it does not spoil. Hmm. So the honey itself is, um, you know, it... It travels well and is always, you know, it, it can, it can, it's, it's fresh. It retains its character for a, for an extended period of time. So I, I think the, the where the where that local where that craft uh, organic uh, nature of, of of things comes into play is really with the with the added ingredients to the mead, the the, the fruits and things of that nature mm-hmm. that are common to use. Shay, what do you think? Uh, better or worse with uh, the way that ingredients move around associated with meads? Well, the great thing about uh, local, you already have a, it's essentially just a, a great marketing strategy. Uh, you already have people who want farm to table. You already have people who want local, who, you know, organic, local, free range. You know, these are these uh, hot topics, hot words that people use in marketing uh so if you have something from your hometown or something from your neck of the woods that people that's an already marketing strategy that's there that hey this comes from down the street hey this comes from one county over it doesn't come from northern california sacramento where you have no idea what it looks like you can actually go to the place see it taste it feel it touch it be be there so a lot with the local farm to table not only let you know what you're eating, let you know what you're drinking, let you know what you're consuming to your body is that it's a it's a huge plus. Uh, a lot of people like that concept about it, and you know if you have an established local market, you also can you know bring in stuff that is from California and say, hey, these are one offs, or hey, this is the Rainier Cheerios we got from you know Washington State, or whatever you're getting or whatever you're doing so uh for me i mean local is always great i mean i always like to support those who are doing something great and being able to uh give back to community well you know that maybe that's a marketing spin that you know some mead makers are kind of missing out on then you know because uh is to really present that very much as a farm to table you know local product as well um you know, I agree with uh, you know what you're saying about uh, you know the transportation of at least you know honey as a, a fairly it's that's still considered a perishable product. It's very sensitive to temperature, but um, the uh, it still does transport you know fairly well, um, and it doesn't require any you know preservative element in order to retain you know the measure of freshness with it. Um, you know, you can have honey that you've harvested and four days later it's still going to taste the same you know it's not like you have to go straight from the you know the basically the hive and and, uh, straight to consuming it within a certain period of time where with some of the fruit that you would actually use in meats i would think would probably have the opposite effect which is you're looking at you know a time from harvest to ripening to actually um working with it uh, in a mash tun, right? You still work with a mash tun in uh, when you make meat, or generally not, or a wine um, press. No, generally not. Uh, a lot of times you'll use whole fruit, mm. uh, either macerated or you know uh, something of that nature. You will use that uh, straight into fermenters uh, in some cases, oh, really? or you can do it straight into secondary. In other words, you can ferment that uh, honey to a certain point and then and rack it into a, a secondary vessel and add your fruit and components, uh, additional components at that point. Huh. There's a number of different ways to do it. Um, there are people that make mead uh, with without heating or boiling the, the honey product first. Uh, there are people who do. Uh, there's still some traditionalists who will will boil the honey prior to uh, putting in the fermenter. Um, I tend to stick to the minimal heat or no heat side of things. I usually use just enough heat to uh, help blend or mix my honey if, with with the water or any other ingredients I'm yeah. adding prior to getting into the fermenter. But you can add that uh, that, that fruit. But th- you're right. There is a. I mean, you're, we're talking windows of of hours to you know a day or so of of peak ripeness freshness with that fruit um actually it's not a bad thing to freeze fruit sometimes when it comes to utilizing it in uh, fermented products 
the freezing process, freezing and thawing, breaks down those cell walls and actually helps that fruit release some of its flavor, some of its juice. So a lot of times I'll pick things at the, the peak of ripeness and then I will, uh, if it's something that calls for cleaning it up or processing it in some way, maybe slicing it, then I will freeze it and you know freeze it for a few days until I'm ready to get it into the fermenter. Like I said, it kind of helps release that flavor and that juice. Mm. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, I enjoyed when I was uh, growing up, my family had a huge cider farm. Um, I mean, a very big cider uh, farm. And we had a cider mill that was, you know, right there on the property. And that's one of the things that I re- really remember growing up was enjoying, you know, basically the fresh cider, you know, um, as well as some of the fermented products that came along, you know, um, maybe two or three months, you know, after the harvest was done. And they actually uh, put up some of the cider and let it you know, ferment naturally and really great stuff and quite amazing. So I think that, you know, that element of the fresh fruit you know for me is kind of stuck in my mind that that's really the path of making either really great cider or really great mead is is having um the elements of not just fresh fruit but you're also paying attention to the elements of sugar or ripeness you know that's you know presented in the fruit itself i mean i know that you make a lot of meat as well jason i mean is that one of the tough tricks is the timing to understand when you're getting ripe um, to work with yeah definitely timing and and nutrients for the yeast the health of the yeast um, fermentation is a huge part of any of these products but be it beer mead uh, cider etc so timing the the temperature and nutrients there's actually times when you need to add additional nutrients during different stages of fermentation of mm. mead to keep that yeast happy and healthy, not kicking off uh, harsh, high alcohol, fusel alcohol compounds mm. or off flavors. So there's there's a lot of timing and and uh, again attenuation in the yeast health. If you if you give that yeast too much sugar. Uh, you could very easily stress uh, that yeast out. It will it will leave you with a product that's too sweet. It hasn't yeah. finished out. You don't have the 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 dry dryness that you might have wanted out of it. Um, I, I have myself. I've ended up with uh, products where I've ended up with far sweeter mead than I had intended. Hmm. So I've had to make a dry mead and then blend those two to get a uh, a nice finished product. Yeah. Well, I've been a, uh, a honey fanatic at times, and although I'm actually down to using like about three different types now, which is a good thing, uh, honey is still a major component in made. And I was curious how you think various honey varieties um, affect mead for things like fermentation cycles, or do they also do things like influence the the taste, you know, of the meat itself? Shay, any thoughts you have around that? Well, I mean, just like anything else, I mean, you get uh, grass-fed beef, you get, you know, free-range chickens. Uh, anything that's going to influence the end product itself is going to be, it's like, you know, from regular honey to clove honey to, you know, uh, orange blossom honey, to which is one of the ones that we're going to be tasting today. But uh, as a whole, anything that is going to affect the surrounding or as we say the tour or whatever is included in the honey or uh whatever the bees consume whatever the um the environment is so yes of course it's gonna uh affect the fermentation it's gonna affect your flavors it's gonna affect everything you know like we were talking about buckwheat honey buckwheat honey you only use in a small dosage because then obviously and as we were saying that you can't take a whole bunch of it no no like in for me when i make tea i use clove honey i use 100 percent clove honey we'll make earl grey tea slice of lemon it's fantastic mm. but you know uh, i've used other types of honey and you know, i've used lavender honey i've used truffle white truffle honey uh, and stuff like that i mean you obviously get different things for different honeys but jason may know more a lot more than i mm. i do on that one uh jason any uh, influence that variety of honeys have on on mead from your perspective uh, that that's really almost the only influence on mead besides the the health of the yeast or the yeast you choose mm. uh, the honey flavor uh what 
what was in that honey and, and uh, what, like like Shay mentioned the the what did those bees consume and and what did they use to make that honey that carries through uh, to the end in almost every case there are subtle flavors subtle compounds that can be stripped out during fermentation uh, where you don't get as much of it in the end product as you would have liked um, and and there are things you can do to help that you can either back blend in some of that original honey to almost back sweeten a drier mead hmm. uh, and get some of your honey flavors and your characters back into the final product but um, uh, you know if you make a mead with 100 percent straight orange blossom honey you will taste that orange blossom honey in the finished product hmm. if you make it with um um, tupelo honey you will taste the character of that tupelo honey yeah. in the finished product so it's it's 100 uh vital i have had um less than great honey and tried to make meat out of it just to, you know, as an experiment to see what i would get yeah and uh the the same i, I had a batch of honey from a local uh beekeeper here that uh, just had a harsh character it was kind of uh I don't know, slightly, slightly burnt, acrid, I guess you would say, oh. and, and, and just just harsh, not very, didn't have a lot of depth or character, and and the finished product was the same way. It just, uh, I made a small batch just to experiment, and, uh, you know, it, it tasted exactly the same as the, the honey did going in when it was finished fermenting, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's just the, the key ingredient it's it's the grape to the wine it's the it's the malt and the hops to the beer it is the, the is the key flavor component well it's interesting that uh not uh in each of the meads you know that we've gone through that they actually don't declare the variety of honey you know that they've worked with and i would think that that would help at least for the mead heads you know um i don't know that that would help the average consumer but i would imagine that that would I mean, I love the the analogy that you're playing off. You know, hit me rather quick because you know what? If I don't know what grape is in that wine, it just pisses me off. You know, <laughs> right off the bat. But that's because you know, I um, I am geared towards thinking about varietals. You know, of of grape uh, grape varietals, and I have a certain expectation for a certain grape varietal of what it should be like, and. At times, you know, uh, at least for wine, I struggle to let it go, especially with Italians, because Italian wines is just so heavily blended, you know. There's some really great, you know, Italian varietals. Don't get me wrong. But they they really tend to blend a lot of things. And what they're going for is they're not trying to present the grape. They're trying to make great wine. Um, and, you know, it... It, I struggle with it, you know, a lot of times tasting it blind because I go, I have no idea what's in the glass, but it's good, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, at least for it, the meads that we've had, I I don't know how you guys, that would probably drive me nuts. You know, if I really enjoyed mead, I'd want to know what kind of variety of honey's in it. Well, I mean, um, it's it's really like we you know go back to wine that's where I, my i first started was wine is that the uh you know you 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 delve so much into it and you know like the italians are notorious for it unless it's governed by the body and you uh you're drinking you know barolo DLC, where yeah. yeah where they have to right. do use 100 percent nebbiolo and they have to do this they have to do that it's just um you know when you blind taste stuff it's just like a a painter who signs a a, a picture if you taste it enough and you and you've seen it and you you can visualize it in your head you know where it comes from and you can see where it yeah. comes from you may not know the grape now um but you know what grows in that region and you know what what's there you know it's you know uh you know it's nebbiolo docelto and uh, things like that in nature yeah. and it's just like a you know artist signing a great painting yeah and you know Another a question that I have in the mead part of it, I know mead as a historical point is that, and this is for you, Jason, um, as an historical factor, is that that mead was something that transported very well. Uh, the Vikings had it on ships. The you know people who who wanted something spirit wise uh, in today's market. How long is the shelf life on today's market of mead? 
there's nobody out there you know beer has born on dates beer has freshness dates you know there's really no in my i mean me as a novice i don't know much about the yeah how long it's going to last and i don't know how many people out there know how long it's going to last i would say there would be two key factors one is the uh, percentage of alcohol and the bricks the element of sugars uh residual sugars that are probably left in it that would have some bearing on how long and i'm thinking probably the sweeter the shorter so uh, a drier abv mead i would think would last um a lot longer than a sweet uh low abv uh mead but that's shooting from the cheap seats <laughs> No, that's that's fairly spot on. Oh, you're I mean, saying that my my BS is actually accurate. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> he is a lawyer, it's, folks. All right, <laughs> it's just like beer. You know, you're not going to to I'm age. A good <laughs> you're not going to age. Uh, you know, uh, a fresh Czech pilsner. You're just not going to do that, right? Why? Why would you? Oh, uh, I do have a couple of my cellar that have been there for a couple of years that we dragged out. So. But um, you know, will it be bad? Maybe not. Will it be uh, different? Certainly. Uh, with mead, I'm, I'm going to say I kind of agree with you the same way. Your higher um, ABV, your richer, uh, more depth of flavor uh, meads will age well. Uh, shorter, short meads, as they as we discussed in, in Mead 101 show, uh, the, the lower alcohol, the fresher meads. And I would imagine... Fruited meads and things of that nature, uh, your pimets and your melomels and things of that nature, uh, could um, be more susceptible to change uh, with that that added element of the fruit mm-hmm. um, in them. So mm-hmm. now, I mean, you get you guys talk about high alcohol, high sugar, and all that kind of good stuff, but you also have guys out there like myself. I mean, Russian imperial stouts. People say, "Hey, age this for five, six years." You have fourteen percent alcohol, the bricks and the sugar. Yeah, it ages great, but you have people saying that the higher the sugar, or higher the alcohol, the less it's going to change. So where where's a good platform when it comes to age? It means do we do five years, ten years, twelve years? I, well, personally, I mean, I, I knowing what I know about these products, I would say they don't age. I don't think they bottle condition or get better with time. That would be my guess. Oh no, they do. Oh, okay. um, uh, they, they. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, to, to, that's zero for two. If you folks <laughs> keep me track, <laughs> to, to give you an example, um, one of the meads that I've I've made a number of times is a kind of a winter spiced mead. It's got. Uh, a little bit of clove, nutmeg, um, cinnamon. As thing. much as you said you hated clove earlier. Hey, I one one clove, <laughs> one clove, one okay. clove in a five gallon batch. You know, so, so uh, and, and some citrus zest and things like that. It's actually a very simple uh, mead recipe, uh, very popular one. A lot of people make it as their first mead. But I have made batches of that and entered it in competition and entered it. In consecutive years, in other words, I've entered it in the same competition when it was two years old, three years old, four years old, and I started winning medals with it at about three years old, and it took best of show in a competition at five years old. So um, hmm. I do age a lot of my meads, but again, like going back to that alcohol strength and, and things of that nature, most of those that I make are, are typically, I make some pretty high alcohol meads. I was meads. about to say. Minor, like minor 13, 14%, 14% oh, okay. yeah, 13, 14, 15% or, or more. Hmm. Uh, and then I do a lot of blending. So I will make a dry mead that's maybe only 10%, and I might blend it with a sweeter mead that's, that's a little bit higher alcohol. Hmm. So. Well, I learned something new today that I can't not BS my way through this. <laughs> And that I can age mead as well. Well, uh, a, a good uh, quick discussion here on our show uh, to get going. We're going to take a quick break here, and we will be right back with more. And we will talk about the meads that we are uh, going to review for today. Be right back. And hello. 
Hello and welcome back to Sip, Sets, and Smokes Masterpiece Mead Theater today as we're discussing meads on this episode that is so riveting, full of fake British accents and pan flute music. <laughs> Thanks for coming back to Sip, Suds, and Smokes. Uh, we are talking about meads and we're going to get to those right now. We have, again, three meads that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first one is uh, Bee Nectar, Miel de Garde, and the second one is also from Bee Nectar called Episode 13. We're going to round out the discussion with um, a mead from Shrams called The Statement as well. So let's get right to it. Uh, the first uh, mead we're going to talk about is Miel de Garde from Bee Nectar. So Bee Nectar is based in Ferndale, Michigan. Um, and uh, this particular, uh, the Miel de Garde, has an ABV of 14%. Um, distribution for bee nectar is uh, um, it's becoming more pervasive. Uh, it's still usually focused around three states, but um, we talked a little bit about distribution issues you know, with mead in our Mead 101 show, uh, so I definitely encourage you to go back and check that out. A very riveting discussion, but you can probably find this uh, mail order um, if you're really interested in probably finding this as well. It may not be at your local li- liquor store is what I'm saying. Um, the description on this, it's a traditional mead made with orange blossom honey, aged for about 18 months in oak barrels. See, there you go, right off the bat. It was aged. Um well, aged in the in the oak barrel, not aged in my cellar, but anyway. For uh, the first release of our Miel de Garde line, we used the highest quality orange blossom honey available, then aged it in a natural American oak barrel for 18 months. The result is bright, aromatic, decadent mead made for sipping, and you would serve this at cellar temperature as well. So, Prior Shea, what do you think about uh, Miel de Garde here from B. Necker? It's probably one of my uh, one of my favorites. I always go back to uh, the whole sauternes and these have these neck these honeys and uh, meads that I've tried so far from these guys have been fantastic. You know, this one has uh, huge legs on it. It's pale yellow uh, in nature, and you know, it being with neutral American oak and. It has a huge orange, burnt orange flavor to it. Uh, great spice, and you know, levels out really well. What's your suds rating on this? Uh, I would go three. A three. Ah, uh, what a relief. Uh, Monk Jason, what uh, what do you think about Miel de Garde from B Nectar? Yeah, I would agree. This one, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, that orange blossom honey that uh, they use carries through quite well you get that aromatic fruit and citrus uh, character in the finished product a um, little bit of alcohol heat not uh, not too bad and it's got that spicy character that spicy character was really about the only thing i got in terms of the oak aging uh, that's probably where that ca- or some of that came from i didn't get a lot of other oak character eh, they said neutral oak so you know maybe it didn't impart a lot uh, but uh, this is this is a strong example um, i gave it a suds uh, rating of three on this one a three as well uh, what a relief my tasting notes on Miel de Garde uh, from B Nectar. You know, I wrote down that uh, it had a light, honey forward uh, presentation. It had kind of a little bit of a dry finish um, off this, um, as opposed to you know some of the other ones that I've had. It's just that was one of the things that kind of caught my attention. I'm just <laughs> taking another sip there. You kind of check that out as well. Jason's probably checking me up going, no, not really, Mike. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it does. You're you're not far off the yeah. mark. Something that, not maybe like a full dry finish, but it's definitely not finishing sweet or neutral. How about that? Yeah. Um, my suds rating for BL de Garde is also a three as well. <clears throat> ah, what a relief. So... Um, our next uh, mead is going to be, <laughs> which <laughs> he's already over here. He's so excited about this. I, 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 
do you want to introduce this since you're such a fanatic about it? All right, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen uh, those who have been waiting for the movie, we're going to bring it to you a little bit earlier. The Death Star has came back. Oh yeah! So here we are with the Be Next Be Nectar episode thirteen. Uh, it's got a big uh, thickness to it. Uh, me and Jason were talking about that it had a strong vanilla, toasted nut flavor, golden raisins, long finish, and this is actually one that I think can actually last for a lot longer than uh, just four or five years. Um, medium thickness, and man, this thing is thing's rocking. I'll go with a four on it. A four? Huh. How about that? Uh, uh, My body should not make that sound. Uh Jason, what do you think about episode 13 from Bean Nectar? I also really enjoyed this one. Um, I got that uh, roasted or toasted nut. I almost said peanut at first. Uh, maybe uh, Shay mentioned cashew, maybe a little more appropriate. Hmm. Uh, but uh, that, 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 that came present in the aroma um, to me and uh, really pleasant in the aroma. Uh, the only place I can think of that that would have come from would have been the uh, the, the honey itself. So uh, it was probably a, a pretty rich, flavorful honey that they used in this. Uh, this one retains a decent bit of the uh, honey character, the sweetness of the honey. And I was really surprised at how well they kept the alcohol in check with this being at 17.5% alcohol, Ooh. this is much smoother than even some of the 14 and 15% alcohol meads that we have tried um, previously. So um, I, I really enjoyed this one. Gave it a suds rating of 4. Wow. How about that? Uh, a body should not make that sound. My tasting notes on episode 13 are... Uh, I wrote down... Um, so, uh, before I go through my tasting notes when i tend to think about enjoying a scar it has three stages there's a beginning a middle and an end and a lot of times when i'm consuming uh, other drinks it's the way it presents itself it's the way it hangs on your palate and the way that it finishes you know as well and i think that was i really felt all three stages you know in this particular mead i thought it had a bitter start to it I thought that it had kind of a blooming, sweet middle to it, and it just kind of uh, tailed off at the end um, in a pleasant way. Um, I actually did not pick up on the nuttiness until you guys mentioned it, and I agree. There's there's something there. Um, a cashew, I think, is very close. Um, it's halfway between like a... a a pecan or a, a cashew or maybe even a blend of the two, you know, kind of, mm-hmm. uh, there's some type of, it's something is creating that bitterness. It's you know, a creamy nuttiness. As well. Yeah, that's it. Um, almost if you had like a cashew peanut butter, that, that maybe that's the right way of thinking about it. Well, cashews as a whole are creamy, um, bigger. It's the, yeah, there's a lot of meat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my suds rating for episode 13, B-Nectar, is a 3. Ah, what a relief. Well, I think the thing that was missing from this particular mead are good, you know, impressions of Star Wars characters. So, so here's my test to you. You have to, you have to talk, how would you describe mead in your favorite Star Wars character? <laughs> You got you got some good good ones to pick from here, so <laughs> I, I'll go first because I at least had more than a minute to think about it. Okay, Luke, Luke, this is your mead calling you. The honey, the honey is so sweet for you. You enjoy the mead, Luke. Yep. What's your rating on that? <laughs> Two. Okay. Yeah, Two. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Pick the only character in the movie that had a memorable uh, name. We could go with Chewbacca, but nobody would understand well, what you we got were Chewbacca, talking about. You got, you got Yoda. You we, know? Could, we could do R2-D2, but I don't make those kind yeah, of noises. You know. 
All right, who's next? <laughs> Look at you, you guys are looking at each other like this no. is not happening, Mike. I have not had enough need to be able to wow. have my wow, favorite yeah. Star Wars character. I'm, I'm not. I'm not drinking this stuff out of a sheep's horn yet. So. <laughs> and, and Jason's pants are still on from the from the moonshine episode. <laughs> Yes, I've not removed my pants yet, so. Ah, oh, well, but there is hope. Pour some sugar. Yeah, I agree. That's what we need. thinks that if we were going to have... I can't even do Yoda. That was, that's <laughs> just so bad. I started down that path. It was an epic fail anyway. All right. Not even a side taste. Sweetness there is. There you go. <laughs> I knew he would channel it eventually. <laughs> it just took another swig of shrimps to get you there, right, Jason? Yes, that's it. That's that it. it. That's it's, like, it's like being stuck in a mini mart with Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you could... You know we we're gonna have an episode pretty soon where it's gonna we're gonna be sucking down helium. Oh, so, that's gonna be good. Yeah, so we're we're gonna have alcohol and helium and microphones combined with the same with the same event. All Look right. at you guys. You're like for those yeah, who are keeping. This. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna be doing whippets, smoking cigars, and drinking alcohol. So you're saying the, the one of the key things that's missing from that episode is a stripper pole, right? <laughs> right. We need the stripper anthem. <laughs> We already have the stripper. I know, but uh, yeah. <laughs> could be our new, uh, our new co-host. You know, audition. You know, what would you, what, what would you do if you, you can't play that song, that song enough? I, I, I don't mean, think so. You, you no. can't get, you can't. I mean, for a one-armed drummer, he was great. <laughs> and you can't play, you can't play enough. I mean, there's, that's why they play it in every strip club in the nation because it never gets old. <laughs> Well, uh, we've had a good time talking about uh, two uh, meads so far. Uh, We have one more to cover. We're going to take a quick break here, and we will be right back. We'll cover our last mead. To Masterpiece Mead Theater here on Sips, Suds, and Smokes, the home of fake British accents, really bad pan flute music, and horrible Yoda impressions. <laughs> I feel like you're gonna be hitting people with a ruler after that well, accent. You know, I'm uh, uh, no, not really, but I'm I'm banned. quite once again. We're, we're absolutely gonna be banned from something somehow. <clears throat> Welcome back uh, to Sips, Suds, and Smokes. You've come back to a show that we have on me today, and we've covered two me's that we're talking about. We have one more to talk about, and hopefully there are more impressions with Star Wars characters involved. Or Vikings. <laughs> or Vikings. It, unless you get a call from George Lucas anytime soon. Are yeah. you saying that... Your your tasting notes would get better if you were drinking mead from a, a sheep horn. I mean, how many how many movies have you seen where they're drinking mead and they don't drink it out of a sheep's horn? I agree. It's well, and you see it spill them on they spill it on themselves well, and they're drinking it in debauchery and the prior or monk. There's is drunk. There's a lot more facial hair involved usually as well. That's true. So, yeah, That's true. you gotta I don't have enough gotta have the hair. big bushy beard, you know, in order to you know pull that off. There is an embarrassing lack of facial hair at this table. I'm the only one with gray in their beard. <laughs> Mine's camouflage. <laughs> it, you have somebody who's my fair skinned, skin. and then you have somebody who's got mostly gray on their face. <laughs> Correct, that's for sure. But, you know, the thing that I always find funny about Viking movies is they're always talking with Russian dialects. Like, you know, like, like, like there's the Ru- never been a Russian Viking <laughs> since they're landlocked for well, the most part. 
Well, Sean Connery would be able to play a Viking. I mean, he has a Scot that's played a Russian, you know? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Hunt for Red October. Right. So why couldn't he play a good Viking as well? I don't know. That's that's, that's a good one. Uh, he would, he'd be the most well-dressed Viking there. I agree. He would be not only the best dressed, but he would be able to fake it really well. Yeah. No, he's... Uh, I wouldn't say he's my favorite Bond, but I mean he's he's been up there. His Yoda impressions would not suck. Gee, <laughs> no, thanks. If, 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 for any listener who knows Sean Connery and can get in contact with us, that'd be great because we have a Yoda spot for him here. <laughs> We'd we... give him plenty of free scotch. He'll be fine and cigars. Well, we have one more weed. One more weed. We have one more me to talk about today. This is not that type of show. <laughs> it's not. Not yet, anyway. We're not based in Colorado. Well, but we're going to be banned from somewhere soon. Uh, we have uh, our last me today is from Strams. It is called the Statement. This has an ABV of fourteen percent. Uh, Strams is also based in Ferndale, Michigan, and. Uh, this is uh, very different than uh, the other meads Anything that, we've, that had. we've had. Yeah. So here's the description from Shrams itself. Kim Shrams, uh, the statement is a result of 20 years of growing Michigan tart cherries and nearly a dozen uh, test batches. Living up to its name, the Melamel's expression of genuine cherry flavor truly makes a statement. The delicate balance of sweet honey and tart cherries makes the sh- the statement a neutral complement to cherry and sharp cheese, chocolate and sharp cheese. Um, its anticipated maturity is actually five years, so this is one that they actually target to seller as well. <clears throat> so, uh, um, again, uh, the distribution on trams very small, actually even smaller than bee nectar, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean... Uh, like I was telling them, this is the first time I've actually even seen a bottle of this stuff. Uh, it's, I mean, this is about as close as the wine as it gets. Mm. For me, it is. Um, you know, it's got the color of Merlot, tastes like Chianti, dark cherries. Uh, you know, it's beautiful representation of what it is. And, you know, Melomel's that we've learned is the fruit inside of meats. Correct, Jason? Yes, Melomel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a drier, semi-sweet, medium to full body. You get a slight dirt, dark current uh, flavor to it. But, you know, it's made with tart Michigan cherries, a little bit of orange spice, maybe a little bit of oriental allspice. But, I mean, this is this is fantastic. What's your sudge rating? Uh, I would do four on this. Four. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Nobody should not make that sound. Monk Jason, what do you think about the statement from Shrams? Oh, I agree. Uh, it's it's very cherry forward. You get that deep cherry aroma. You get it in the taste. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised uh, with the aroma. I also got some brighter uh, berry, almost berry-like components in the aroma as well. Uh, but the flavor is, is all that deep, rich uh, cherry flavor. Um, the I think that uh, for me personally, this one my, the cherry might override the the flavor character of the honey. the The sweetness of the honey is there, and it balances well with the tart uh, component of the cherries. But I think maybe it's just slightly. When I think of of, of meads and melomels, it, it's a balance. It's a balance between the added uh, component and the honey itself. And and like ciders, you never want to override the 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 core component, that core honey, uh, or in a cider, the apple. You never want to override that with the fruit that you've added to it. Mm. And I think in this one, uh, the only the only nick or knock I have on this is that I think the cherry might slightly override the honey. Uh, the the honey is like I said, it's there to balance the the tart character of the of the of the cherry but uh, so that's the that's the one thing that knocks it from a four to a three for me so my suds rating on this one's a three i did enjoy it but mm. <clears throat> a three uh, what a relief so uh my tasting notes on shrams the statement um you know i uh the one thing that i wrote down was i wrote it was fruit forward um and i completely agree with you know your statement jason is the 
you know the compliment between the fruit and the honey is a bit off balance here but at the same time the thing i wrote down is uh this is tastes like black cherries candy um it's very pleasant and uh i think to really probably enjoy more than a half glass of this you know i that would be pretty tough for me I wrote down, this is the perfect port alternative. I think that if somebody uh, really had an, a, an affinity towards ruby ports and for whatever reason they just you know either couldn't get a hold of a great ruby port or they were really looking for some alternate, man, I love this. F- for, a, for a port head uh, you know, like myself, I, this, was, this was a great, uh, this was a really great mead. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I... I really agree with it. Just a little bit too much fruit, you know, right up front, but not to the point that it's so off putting. It's just something that, you know, kind of captured your attention rather quickly. Mm-hmm. Definitely on the nose. Oh my God. The first time this went, I was within even like four inches of it. I could smell it. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, hey, hello, Mr. Black Cherry. <laughs> I definitely got that. Really great mead. Uh, it was one of my favorite out of the flight uh, as well. I gave this a four. Uh, uh, a body should not make that sound. Well, uh, really great uh, flight all around, and uh, all of these were very different. Uh, again, a very broad range, you know, flight. So, um, if you guys had to go back to one of these three, which one would you go to? Even though all of our tasting cups are empty again. <laughs> I'd definitely go back to the uh, episode 13. Hmm. That one was, uh, I think, the, the thing that stand out for me. Um, you want to channel Chewbacca, right? I do. I do. <laughs> I do. I do want to channel Chewbacca. And, and uh, I just, I would need more of this. Probably probably two to two and a half bottles. I think I could channel Chewbacca. That's actually the sound you would make if you finished two and a half bottles of this. Oh, okay. <laughs> from the floor. <laughs> yeah. You would make that from sound from the floor of the well, bathroom. I would say that there are probably some, you know, diehard Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, fans that they're so worried about what J.J. Abrams is going to do with that franchise, they'd rather drink the mead than actually see the movie. You know, they're like, oh, my God, what is it going to be? Well, they had, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, dude, Kevin from um, Silent Bob. The the guy he, apparently who, from Silent Bob and uh, Jay the Clerks, Bob. yeah, Jane the Client Silent Bob. So they had him. Uh, I guess Spielberg asked him out to see a you know a rendition or a clip of a it. daily, yeah. And apparently it made him cry because he was such a huge uh, uh, Star Wars fan that he was so so moved by the uh, rendition that he they actually posted a picture on instagram and twitter of him crying after he'd seen it oh my goodness so well, uh, I, I think the principal that, characters has got to die that's it that's gonna be awesome yep for all you star wars people <clears throat> it's, i don't know who it's gonna be <laughs> well it's not gonna be uh r2d2 yeah i know he's 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 lived a little, a little bit of time yeah yeah, he just uh, he has uh, moments of reincarnation. They just keep on wiping his memory. He has no idea where he's at. See, I don't know how they're. How, you know, is this going to be an, an uh, after the last one, or which which episode is this? After you get to the second bottle of mead and you finish it, you'll figure it out. Because <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, because there was one person who was telling me that there was a uh, there's books that you know talk that was written for. All the Star Wars people, I won't call y'all geeks, but raise Trekkies. your hand. Yeah, not Trekkies. Not, they're not, don't call them Trekkies. No, no, no. I wouldn't You'll do get that. hate mail. I will. I already have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Aficionados. Yeah, aficionados. Yeah, aficionados. Yes, Those yes. who are aficionados, read uh, these are just books where it has Princess Leia and Han Solo already <clears> have <throat> grandchildren. And so it'll be interesting to see who the mm-hmm. main characters die. Well, let's uh, wrap things up for today on uh, our show. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks to all our listeners on uh, Sips Out the Smokes. You can catch all of our episodes online on iTunes, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Stitcher, YouTube, Uncle John's Basement, and Spreaker, our native media host. Our terrestrial radio stations are always wondering, you know, I think that I could probably do a better Darth Vader uh, impression than those guys on the radio show. Anyway... Listen, send them a uh, mask from Star Wars, as well as a uh, bottle of that Shrams, and tell them you want to hear the show. 
uh, on your favorite radio station. Send them a note and copy us as well. You can reach us online anytime. Info at sipssudsandsmokes.com is our email address. Our daily tasting notes are on Twitter every day at Sip Sud Smokes. Our Facebook page is always buzzing with lots of news. Sip Suds and Smokes is sponsored by Craft Beer Kings. Craft Beer Kings, the home for all your beer, wine, and mead needs. It's home of the mystery box. You can check them out online, www.craftbeerkings.com. Listen, do us a favor, take the time to rate this episode if you're listening to us online. That's a big help to us, and we get to see your feedback as well. I want to thank my co-host for being here, Prior Shay. Everybody drink well. And Monk Jason. Thank you for having me and reminding everyone to kick back and taste something tasty today. Absolutely. This is Good Old Boy Mike asking you to join us once again and keep on sipping. This has been a one tan hand production of Sip Suds and Smokes, a program devoted to the appreciation of some of the finer slices of life. From the dude in the basement studios, your host, the good old boys, will see you all next time.